Boston, Massachusetts. I've been affiliated with ACI for a very long time now. Um, in addition to having the great privilege of working with um, uh, Youth United Artists, um, I have worked with ACI for a long time. I was the 2015-2016 uh, Artist in Residence, um, International Artist in Residence. I had the opportunity through ACI to live and work in Nigeria, specifically Oshoko and Ovidi Jumu, um, uh, studying traditional weaving and dyeing. And because of ACI, that has had an amazing impact on my artwork, and I've been able to come back and work with my community, teaching these to my community in Boston. So I'm very thankful for ACI for the work that they do and the impact they've had on my life. Um, uh, to begin our closing keynote, um, we have uh, Julia Ryan from the Mayor's Office of Art and Culture. about equity in the arts 
And um, so that was something that not only we should be thinking about through our cultural plan, but we should be thinking about and planning for through policy and programming um, and funding through the city. And so one of our goals, our plan, is to cultivate a city where all cult cultural traditions are expressed, are able to be expressed, are represented, are promoted, and are equitably resourced, and where everyone has opportunities to engage with arts and culture in a way that's accessible in a holistic way. So we are working really hard toward this goal. We are a few years into um, working on our cultural plan and kind of putting it into action, and there's a few ways we've been doing this. Um, one of them is through our Artists in Residence program, which we have had um, the privilege of funding for the past three years, and we plan to continue doing so. This uh, program has allowed local artists to <coughs> embed themselves in city departments, um, in you know spaces where you might not historically expect an artist, anywhere from the police department to um, you know all of our community centers throughout the city to different departments that do permitting and the nitty gritty of licensure and stuff like that. Artists to help really help the city think about ways that we can creatively um, improve our programs and also how we can do a better job using social practice art to build community engagement and build relationships. So that's something that we're really excited to continue doing. Um, another thing that we have been working on recently <coughs> is we created a new award for our arts and cultural organizational grant that we annually um, make available for local arts and cultural organizations to apply for, which is a grant to help fund all of the wonderful work that they're doing in Boston. We recently created an award to specifically highlight organizations that are really um, examples and leaders, models of what an equitable organization should be from their hiring practices to their programming to um, the ways that they fund artists to kind of any way that they are doing their work in a radical and different way and are really honoring equity in our city. And I'm so excited to say that one of those three awardees for this new award was Arts Connect International. So another round of applause. <laughs> Negro. Or perhaps you just don't see my wings. 
But the problem is that I'm trying, and I'm crying, because I can't see, I can't believe, and I can't achieve. As I get older, I shouldn't be getting smoldered. I should be getting faster, stronger, higher, and closer. But I can't. I can't and I want to. I can't and I want you. I want you to see that there is something more to me. Here I am, as delicate as I can be. In my cotton fields are roses out of the concrete. I want you to set me free like Maya Angelou did with her caged bird. A bird's tune can never be heard if you pluck its feathers. A caged bird can never be heard if you control the weather. Stop taking advantage of me. Stop taking, that's T-A-K-I-N-G. Stop torturing me, stop scorching me, stop planting your hopes and your dreams in me. You're giving me way too much responsibility. I'm just 16, can't you see? Can't you see what you've done to me? I'm only 16, but I'm writing like a 23. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes I feel like my mind is older than me, like my mind is growner than me, like my mind took my sight from me. You turn me into an old soul. An old soul cannot be phoenix cannot rise from the ashes. And now my mind is my eyes, I'm blind, and now I can't see. Now I can't preach, and now I can't sing. Look what you've done to this legendary bird, reduced to its eggshells, whose chirps are fractured and will never be heard. Now excuse me, while my mind programs me to think, and please do not disturb. Our bodies strangely light, 
mirrors to the stars in the cloudless sky, wings unfurling on our backs. of our 
teeth, but brought, brought no trace of the ocean from where we came. Seas root with light. A child wakes 2.30 a.m. screaming in one prison, her mother in another, no mountains, no flights. We were 50 in a barrack. We were children under the eye of a bayonet. We were starved in moonlight, and we made dresses from newspapers, and we began to disintegrate. And as we began to disintegrate, we began to burn, and in the screaming, a bird rose into the night to meet the moon, broad wings and bloody. Pour me my arrow, moon. Let us find our way. And I'll just end with this short poem. I vow to be the small flame. My people, we have found too shallow our roots in this land full of boulders we inherited. But when the satellites fall, I vow to use my good sense of direction to find me. Songs make provision. I vow all the spells to turn our capillaries into branches, sea, waving sky. We will not be undone. To the end, I vow to keep our fire lit until we find our free. Thank you so much.
To say we're treated equally to insult my intelligence. Now I apologize to my family for my incarceration. I spent eight years gone, eight years long, and I was wrong. I tried to explain that I succumbed to circumstances far beyond my knowledge's reach, resulting in my actions extending the distance further than my understanding could see. Back against the wall, suffocated under circumstances, and y'all, I needed money to eat. But thinking about it leaves this sour taste in my mouth. Because now making it out may have been more probable than previously perceived, but in moments of stress, reflex overpowers contemplation and situations deceive. So hindsight doesn't accurately express what I momentarily believed. It was back against the wall, suffocated under circumstances, and y'all, I needed money to breathe. I'm just grateful that I had a family that still loved me. I'm even more grateful that they prayed to a Lord above me in a world so ugly, and I'm just asking y'all to do the same. Please, don't judge me. Peace. This next poem is the first three weeks of me being home and the mental things you go through. Just returning to society after a time so long that some of my friends came up and thought I was dead. They heard I died. And I just popped up out of nowhere. But this is called Go There. I was struggling, really struggling. You see, dealing with the return to society from incarceration is complicated. I even had difficulty engaging in casual conversation. I used to hear there's reluctance in my eyes, and I gave off this vibe of frustration. You see, anxiety weighs heavy. I used to deal with it often. Institutionalization, the enemy, the fight against it, exhausting. Keep in mind, I was gone before Twitter and Instagram, back when Michael Jackson was alive and Bush was in office. Coming home, it can be hard to relate or hard to find place, and even harder to keep pace. Simple things as a man get difficult, like imagine trying to date. Especially if she feels like you're vulnerable and your position allows you to be easily molded or shaped. Or she feels your embrace to take shape or piece to pass the quote from her heart. She feels some obligation to replace. Or what if you two have been through it? And since they have suffered, they feel you had an obligation to be mates. It's crazy when you consider that often the kind hearted fall victim to obligations they create. See, I never want any bond based off no charity case, and I ain't gonna try to force love with love obviously ain't. I can't promise to provide the energy a relationship requires if I feel like I can't. I have so many demons I gotta face, and it just wouldn't be fair. I said, I have so many demons I gotta face, and I don't think you wanna go there. I don't think you wanna go there, because if we go there, we gotta go where I was projected and predicted to be another statistic. I'm the oldest of three kids, one sister, one brother, the son of two fellas, a figure of the reflection of my father and mother, raised by one parent when daddy departed, leaving a woman and her kids off East 22nd, Columbus, Ohio, single bedroom apartment, a couple sheets and a blanket on a mattress on the carpet. They tell us home is where the heart is, but what about when home is ours? And I don't know why my father departed and did what he did, the doctors delivered his kid, he did without a care, regardless of how desperate we live. But the effect of this is a kid on the edge who didn't care, a kid in a position where both robber and victim were terribly scared, but that's a whole other form, and we ain't finna go there. We're not gonna go there because I don't think I can go there. I don't even know if I know how. See, society has brought harm to my heart, and reality has hollowed it out. So as a poet, I see him calling me the poet, but inside, I'm hollering out like maybe I do need love, and I ain't never known love to think it's a route. So I travel about, bitter and beaten, marked and scarred, and suffocated under the weight of my own shortcomings. I just struggle for air. Now I'm opposed to those that want to be there out of fear my self-destruction will bring hurt to those that honestly care. I'm a victim of a pain that I don't love, I don't share, and I've been here my whole life, praying none of y'all gotta go there, you see. They tell me to look at the bigger picture. What doesn't seem wrong is the problem with the bigger picture is not fully developed. And the frame wasn't built too strong. So when they tried to post it to show it, it couldn't hold it. It collapsed and folded. So now that image is falling. So as far as what the future holds, y'all, I can't call. I just know why I write what I write and I spit what I share. I know what it feels like to wear your heart on your sleeve and bear all your fears. I know what it feels like to feel like this entire world doesn't care because I've been where I've been, y'all. And I'm just glad none of y'all have
and uh, hearing and learning about different ways of how people are working towards bringing equity to the field. I believe that the one way uh, that we can dismantle these systemic issues is through hearing each other's stories and educating ourselves and then changing the way that we contribute to the systemic in inequities ourselves. Um, so I want to take this moment to thank all the artists and the panelists who came and shared their stories, their words, their art. Um, it's, uh, we just really appreciate your courage and your willingness to be here. So thank you all. Well, you get the future. 
um, to equity, uh, Paulette, perhaps we can start with you. What is the critical challenge that you receive in the work? Um, what is the critical challenge? Um, well, funding always remains a challenge, so there is always funding. Sorry. Um, uh, funding always remains a challenge, but I think the challenge really is about how we perceive ourselves. So although, um, and who um, controls us, so for me, there's a relationship with what I call the parent, and the parent is the funder. And so as a diverse organisation, you know, um, we want to um, appeal to the, to the funder and do what the funder wants in, rather than what we want. And um, so um, the, the challenge is really to um, be yourself. And um, yeah, that's it, challenge to be yourself.
now that that interest and um, you know the interest is moving toward um, a center and a center that's founded very uh, resolutely in blackness. Um, what happens when you have gatekeepers at these institutions that have been trained and institutionalized in a way in which they know absolutely nothing about blackness? It's not their training, it's not their vision, it's not an interest, it's not, um, it's not the way in which one lives. How then are they entrusted to tell these stories? And are they willing or capable to move out of the way um, to either make room for the people who are qualified to do this work? Um, um, to do this work, um, where are the resources going to come from to train people um, to do this work, not just, you know, not in the sense of, okay, we're going to hire a black curator or a Latinx curator just because they are these identities. I mean, is the rigor there, the scholarship there? And, you know, what is this going to cost in terms of all sorts of resources to make sure that these artists, not just Basquiat, but an entire canon, are, are getting the respect and dignity and rigor that they deserve? Hey, can you Exactly what you do. <laughs> we know you do something else called hip hop and garbage. Typically, don't go together. Uh, tell us what are you doing? How you got there? And what are the critical challenges you're still seeing in the work? Great. But first, a pop quiz. Yes. Yeah. I'm going to challenge that. Um, what hip hop magazine was founded at Harvard? What? <laughs> wow. Mm -hmm. The source. So hip hop and Harvard have been homies for a minute, um, but what is qualified as peripheral or like history that gets to be ignored because it is hard hard and all of its 1636-ness. Um, it's like the still people show up in spaces, right? Um, so uh, yeah, the Source Magazine was started there by some students in 1988. Um, so there you go, this Time. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and beyond that, um, the Hip Hop Archive was founded by Marcelina Morgan, um, and she started it in uh, Stanford, and when she came to Harvard, she brought it there. So there has been a history of hip hop in Harvard, um, which is not necessarily exceptional, uh, because hip hop is everywhere. So there's also that. Um, and so hip hop has been part of my human living history. I found it on my porch in St. Louis in the 80s. Um, that's I just, I feel like that's where you meet hip hop, for real, for real. But now we can meet it in the academy. Um, but why that's important is because as in the sector of education, um, we use language like formal education and informal education. And I purposely don't try to buy into that because I think actually some of the most formative um, learning that has stuck with me that has actually been helpful happened on the block, in the neighborhood, in those community settings. Um, that were intergenerational. Um, no offense to anybody who's like a math whiz, like my sister's one, I don't want to relate it all the time. But, um, <laughs> the, the advanced AP calculus hasn't come to the fight. <laughs> <laughs> but my ability to know how to sit in circles and communal spaces and ciphers, my ability to sit in intergenerational spaces, um, to learn with young people, to let that language that is happening and transacting through all for all of us through hip hop is something that has been quite um, telling, and so that is the that is the work behind the hip hop education lab that I started. Um, it's called Hip Hop X, and it's EX to see like what does it mean to have a laboratory experience where high school students and graduate students were studying education. Radical idea to have people studying education spaces with young people. Um, <laughs> shots fired. Take them how you need them. Um, <laughs> but the idea is to see what happens when we are pivoting. What do we mean by teaching and learning by centering it off of hip hop, which is a shared experience we got on the train at different points. I don't know a lot about these mumble rappers, but I get to sit in the seat of learning from the young people. We had a beautiful exploration happen off of just studying the message by Grandmaster Flash that opened us up to all of these amazing personal stories being shared and young people offering. Schools don't care about us, so we don't care about schools. But where there is care, there is learning. We know that that has been documented over and over again. So hip hop is the access of, of, of letting care be at the forefront. Um, and so that's kind of the idea behind the hip hop education lab. Um, and just you know, shameless uh, use of this of this space. If you all are around on Saturday, April six, we're having a free conference at Harvard, young people and adult people eating and jamming out together. Um, because I have this also radical, but it's so simple notion that what if schooling 
looked different. <laughs> what if it had nothing to do with brick and mortar buildings that are decaying anyway? What if it had to do about um, just shared culture, learning from each other, vibing off and creating together? Might something radical and dope happen? <laughs> Do you have a definition of equity? Oh, sure. <laughs> and if you can work, what's your critical challenge that you see? Right, I remember those questions. <laughs> um, also daily, boring, boring days. Just all over the city, boring. No day to day. Um, equity, I was just sharing that like, I think, um, I think if you ask me this question in a month, I might have a slightly clearer definition, but I think equity is a verb um, more than this noun that we are fixated with sometimes, like we know the image, equity versus equality, the three people that the fans and the craze. Sometimes, we Google it later, it's fine. Um, and so I think a lot of times, um, it's like we're trying to get somewhere, but the, the other side of that is we actually do not know what it's like to live in an equitable society. And so I think it's important to be driven by images and ideas of what it means, but I like to think about the work of it is very firm, it is action, it is it is nuanced, it is joyful, it is messy, it is showing up every day. It is it meeting you even if you didn't ask for it because it's Sunday, you want to sleep in, um, but you get that email and there it is. And so I think equity is like work and it's also going, where am I in this? Where, how many crates am I standing on? Um, and am I willing to acknowledge that I might be standing on more than the person next to me? And why is it easier for me to point out what they got and not where am I? What have I internalized that is also oppressive messaging? So I think it's, that's, the, that's the verb of it, it's like this constant action of like reflecting. I think the challenge as far as the sector that I'm in is thinking about who's at the table. Again, I'll just go back to the idea of the lab is um, anybody focused on education reform who doesn't have the space for young people at the table, you're lying. You just flat out, it's not gonna work. Um, and I think that in conversations with young people, that's some of the most important learning that I get. And so that's the opportunity I think we face is to go um, can we keep radically collaborating? Can we keep um, maybe by invitation, maybe by a little force, um, shifting some chairs at the table um, so that those who need to be there to, to push the proverbial needle um, are there? Or are we really actually having just a siloed conversation where choir and choir leaders just say the same things over and over again? Thank you. Nice to meet you. I'm sorry, you have an interesting articulation of equity as creative justice. Tell us a little bit more about that definition and what is the phrase injustice, creative injustice that you've seen in the work you're doing? Okay, um, so to me, equity is different from equality in that equality, everybody gets the same thing, right? Even if you might need something different to be successful. So equity actually is an assessment of what uh, people need to be successful, what intervention they need to be successful. And you have to actually ask them what intervention do you need to be successful or something like it? So um, it also acknowledges that uh, marginalized and oppressed groups of people will need different things to be successful. Women, in general, need very different things to be successful than cisgender men, right? But if you truncate women, if you look at women of color versus trans women, uh, women of all types, you have to actually ask them what they need to be successful. That's what equity is. Uh, equity is only one part of creative justice, though. So if we were to actually um, achieve the manifestation of all people living creative and expressive lives on their own terms, it's gonna take access, diversity, equity, and inclusion. Not just equity, equity is only one piece of it. There are four pillars of it. You need all four pillars to uh, be successful. Um, the four pillars suggest different strategies and different approaches. Um, and if you wanted to break it down and be you know, very, very specific, for example, when it comes to access and diversity, women, in the arts management workforce, that's, that's why I'm an arts administration professor, uh, they're overrepresented. And they're overrepresented because about 77% of the arts management workforce is female, right? So in terms of access and diversity, uh, we, we've done it, right? But we still have a lot of work to do when it comes to equity and inclusion. Are women paid the same as their male counterparts who are doing the same work, right? Are the policies, um, uh, inclusive enough so that women don't have to decide whether they're going to have a family or a career. And so it, it, it's, 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 it's a very big um, um, philosophy or way of thinking. And to pinpoint one creative injustice, um, I don't think that's fair. Okay. okay. I can give you a list. <laughs> 
<laughs> like, it's highly problematic that 90 to 95% of all of Africa's cultural products uh, exist in Europe. Like, that's, is that not weird? Like, if we went and took, you know, the Mona Lisa, or some of the other cultural products that Europeans really value, and hoarded them in Africa, they wouldn't like that. Yeah, with it, you know, they wouldn't let that go down. So I did it okay that we've done that. Um, and so then you, you, we're getting into these discussions about repatriating art, right, where the French president, he um, commissioned this report to try to start having that conversation. And he have, I'm sorry, Shane, but the museum and the arts market, they're saying, well, but we don't want to give it back, essentially. You know, how do you establish provenance and who it really belongs to? Well, you took it from those people, just give it back. <laughs> you know, like, just give it back. Like, just give it back. Right. See, so you raise an interesting point on that last note, uh, that, that these things will not be freely given. <laughs> Everything you do in an access is very, very uh, uh, kindly returned. <laughs> so in the work, let's talk about the action and the activism. We have to go take it. American model for me versus mm. the, uh, the UK model. And um, uh, we're funded very differently. Um, we're funded through the Arts Council England. And um, you have four year funding rounds. And um, to get into that is hard work. Um, and it's a thing called you become a national portfolio organisation. And there's about 900. And if I look at the sector that I'm in partly within that, it's dance. And of those 964, of those 900 um, is dance. Of those 64, 12 of them are diversity. Of those 12 that are diversity, four are African Caribbean. And of those four, only two um, are female led. And so you start to look at what does equity look like and what does access look like and what have we really got. And so what we have to do is then uh, I am in for guerrilla tactics and guerrilla marketing and guerrilla ways of getting things done. You just have to take over and take centre stage and take it back for yourself. So if you get a rejection, you know, um, you put the application back in within a week. Then you get another rejection and you put it back in. And then you take the second rejection and you say, well, actually, you just reject me even though I fit all the criteria. And you start to challenge it because you've got nothing to lose. You've got absolutely nothing to lose for putting it out to the press, doing whatever. What have you got to lose? You haven't got anything in the first place. Um, so, um, you know, you, you just need to take take that back, that control. It also, for me, is uh, uh, about um, uh, changing the model, changing the model of the parent, uh, you know, and looking at that model and having a different approach to it and saying that actually we are entrepreneurial, we are a business and looking at that business case as well. So you have to have a clear business case alongside taking what you're entitled to. And the business model is really, really important. If we look at, for me, um, coming from a Caribbean background, and we look at Carnival, Carnival used to get all its money from, uh, through um, being very, very entrepreneurial and from lots of different sources. Now everyone else is taking those different sources and Carnival's dying on its arse and we've got no money coming in. We need to take back that center stage. We need to create different models, and we need to also, um, we need to um, open up the landscape so we can see what has gone before. So the, the whole thing about the archivings and, and um, research, so we're doing all these different things simultaneously. This is where you help me get some out of the back. Yeah. So take a look at, um, and so, um, so what we're doing was, we're not just um, doing um, uh, putting on a dance festival. We're also, you know, writing for ourselves. All our publications have got black writers in it. All our publications are, uh, uh, are owned by the artist, by you, not by me. It's not the whole Ed Brooks book. These are, these are your voices. And we need to punctuate what has only gone before. So we open up that ground so it's given a different dialogue, a different, a different voice, and so our voices are in it. Our voices are missing from the conversation. If you put it on the internet, it's gone in five years. 
So we need to find other ways of making sure that we're in, that we're, we're, we're part, of the, part of that. So for me, I suppose I'm always a bit of an activist. I talk about my guerrilla style of doing things. It is really, um, and it's a thing that I, I talked to the panel about before, it's about being confident, but not being arrogant, because there's a fine line between the two. But actually instilling that com confidence where we can take back and, and control and write and talk you know, passionately um, and um, positively about our work and, and not go just thinking there's a begging bowl. Because once we went with the begging bowl, we actually lost a lot of stuff as well. We didn't gain as much as we thought. Thank you. Well, we, we know that you're not a fighter. I think uh, your personal obsession was the fighter side of you. Right, you're fighting the good fight of our equity. What have you found in a personal institution level to be a successful one for that? What's, what's we're fighting about personal well, right? So, wait, is the question like, what does it refer to? When you're fighting the good fight of our equity, mm -hmm. what, what are good weapons? What have been the most successful <laughs> weapons <laughs> of war for you in the fight of our equity? She had told us some things. Yeah, so, yes, 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 Well, um, <laughs> I think um, well, I think kind of thinking about uh, Basquiat and sort of and myself sort of separately maneuvering through institutions. Um, I think that you have to really, really know who you are um, because. Um, I think when you're engaging with institutions that are virulently white and have invested in that identity and have weaponized um, their resources to protect that position, um, no matter you know whether you're an artist, whether you're a curator, whether you are even uh, a museum goer, you have to really know who you are because you're going to get messaging and visuals that just are not who you are, they're just not accurate. And so in terms of being able to fight that good fight, I, you know, I shared earlier, I think that it really behooves, I think, people of color who are engaging administratively with museums that maybe have one foot in, one foot out, um, whatever that looks like, to be able to have distance so that um, there's room to move. Um, because I think, just very frankly, um, we're talking about, uh, and this is not necessarily just the moving on, we're talking about institutions, museums, um, you know, peer institutions in a way that have been um, deeply white for a very long time, decades, centuries. And to say that they're not violent is just not accurate. No one would believe me if I said that. And no one would believe me if I sat here and said, no, the movie behind is not violent. So I think that you, um, you know, I think that that's both insulting to me and what people know about the history and the times that we're in, and also the history of these museums. Um, so that being said, I think that being able to have a, a relationship and a distance where you can both say the truth but maneuver with the art, um, bring the artist in, um, but also recognize that even though we're having these conversations about changing the boards, changing territorial um, rooms, um, what 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 does it look like? You know, for I don't know, the Whitney for moment to curate. We also have to acknowledge that. Some of these institutions may be so toxic that it is just not healthy for people of color to be there in-house. And so what can we do to make sure that it is safe for people of color or other marginalized people to be in these institutions full time? That's right. <laughs> Here's when we, we look at uh, other industries, for-profit industry, corporate, um, the education, are we, ahead, and we're all kind of working on this issue of equity, are we in the arts industry ahead of the curve with respect to our peer industries of for profit, corporate, academia, or are we behind? What, 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 what the delta? Yeah, just curious. Where, where are we? Where are we? Yes, who are our wishes to answer? I will take 
that we are a reflection of the society that we exist in. So I don't know that we're behind, ahead, or at the same place. Mm -hmm. I think that's the most honest answer that I can give. And I think people in the cultural sector, uh, some of them have fooled themselves into thinking that because we're connected to culture and we're practicing artists and we're connected to our humanity uh, in these exceptional ways that we have transcended racism, sexism, heterosexism, ableism, all of the isms that we have not. And I think you know it's a blind spot for us if we don't be honest with ourselves and grapple with the fact that we are a reflection of the society in which we exist. Now, because we're so close to our humanity, we can use our humanity as a way to lead society if we are to be more honest about that. But I answer a specific question. Okay. So when I look at media, and I compare the last 15 years, I've seen a shift, but a very clear shift, right? In terms of my being able to see myself reflected in, in the media. Why did that happen? But why is it that when I go into a museum to reflect and source that show me, I may, I see dead white people. Um, why is that? What's the, what, why, is, why is media and that and the for-profit industry should be able to make that shift? Or even when I go into um, a boardroom, right? I, I see myself more reflected there. When I, when I turn on my TV, I see myself reflected in those, in those instances. When I go into a museum, I do not see myself. So I would argue we're lagging, and I'm curious, what's the difference? Why can't we get there? What's the problem? Uh, so capitalism. I think is the reason why it looks like there's been some change in certain sectors. Right? Okay. Money, money yeah. is, you know, I mean, that's why you have like Blackish and you have uh, Fresh Off the Boat, and all these shows that we didn't have before. Um, the Black Panther, that movie. Like, why, why, why 2018? Like, that movie could have been made so much earlier. Um, and the thing is, the for-profit and the non-profit industries both exist in a capitalist society. I think that the white supremacy that is um, kind of the root of the nonprofit structure uh, has prevented more progress in terms of what we can see. Because yeah, 46% of museums boards are white. That, that, that is very true. And so um, until we can figure out a way to make it um, so that there are financial repercussions for not being more reflective of the actual society in which we exist, it's going to keep moving slower. Okay, so we have a fundamental challenge here, which is you're saying that in some degrees, in the for-profit industry, we can take advantage of the fact that the audience, uh, the buying power, is diverse, and so we can leverage that to move the needle forward. So we're kind of in a little bit of a conundrum here, in the Asian because we're in a work of vicious cycle, right? Because the audience and the venues don't have um, a diverse audience, then what's the incentive? There's no incentive. So this is where the creative potential of this group will really come to the So we got it, and I'd like you to fix it now. So, <laughs> so tell me what is the most creative, entrepreneurial, innovative approach you see either in your work or in a peer's work that has really shifted the needle? What, what have you seen that could disrupted this industry so far that we could look to as potentials for the future uh, world that we live in? No pressure. Yeah. <laughs> Part of me is just gonna ignore that whole like fix it now. <laughs> <laughs> that pressure just takes it, actually fix it. Well, you know, I'm, I'm magical and I'm real at the same time. So, um, you know, there's that. Um, okay, so coming from the education world, I think there are some things that are happening that are exciting um, and also uh, could be. I just think indicative of what I personally think should happen is that the school structures that we have as we know it just, they need a simultaneous like internal disruption and dismantling and we also need folks who are working on the outside. Like this, Sean Chin Wright always says like we're so ready to disrupt and dismantle but we don't have people who have the competencies um, and the wherewithal to rebuild so that we don't replicate what we've been internally like just making scripts, then we just get all that for a big fat zero, nothing. Um, so I like to point to um, a couple of examples, especially at the crossroads of uh, hip hop and like, so there's a high school for recording arts in Minneapolis, anybody in the know? Okay, and also they opened a campus in um, LA this past year, and that is, um, every student has an individualized learning plan, and so thinking about how in education where 
if students have IEPs, there's a bit of that individual attention, even though some schools drop the ball, but a whole school that's going, hey, you might actually know what you and how you learn, and we're gonna put entrepreneurship also um, in, the, in the mix of this as hip hop is a pivot, because I think one of the opportunities and, and what that school is a model for me is like, let's not forget that artists and arts organizations are businesses. Like, I think we, um, like the sector, arts, arts world, how we want to follow that, like, have to really challenge ourselves up about this anti-business mindset we are accidentally um, kind of upholding. Like, you can't take care of your pocket and know how to speak that language, and know how to see how that fits with another, like, folks that you're out interacting with, and then I don't know how far that's gonna go for you. And so to know that there's a school where there's financial literacy and entrepreneurship written into it, I think that, is in a way pipelining people to be in leadership of arts organizations better than what we have now. Because we have a big opportunity um, shift, I say, with a lot of baby boomers retiring from leadership in arts orgs where we might be able to disrupt the statistics of um, predominantly white female leadership and boards that are still very, very white. But if our young people have don't know the business mindedness, and if they are still struck by, oh my God, museums are where all the dead white people go, because that's what I suffer from, and they're not looking to step into that. They don't understand that, that that's a place where they can, that they belong. And so I think that like in education, when you have schools that are, there's a school in Colorado that's starting with the students were also involved with the hiring of the board. And one young lady who I met, she's 15, she said, if you want to be a board member, you actually have to come into the building. You can't be this in absentia, like, fictitious person. <laughs> That's a 15-year-old, okay? <laughs> trying to say young people are so hip and so knowledgeable. Need, and they're, so they're designing the school with young people's input. That's going to impact when people and how people are entering this quote-unquote job sector, what that means. So I just want to highlight that. That's not going to be a light switch. I mean, I think there's nothing been more well-developed than the, the plan and the business structure of white supremacy, like they didn't leave any corner untouched. Like hetero, patriarchal, able, white supremacy was like, we got every nook and cranny of this. And that took time. So I also want to say like, there's gonna be no rough microwave answer. And it's work, it is a verb over time. So I think education, um, and what we, how we think of schooling, and what we put on the table and what is centered, hopefully not Eurocentric modes of teaching or learning, I think that's going to be critical, and there are models popping up more and more, so that keeps me hopeful. And so you mentioned some innovation around funding models that you've seen that particularly successful. Can you share some of those with us? Um, okay, so um, one of the things that I appreciate about the mm -hmm. museum field in the U.S. did was uh, first they got the Mellon Foundation to fund this um, diversity uh, in art museum study in 2015. And so, um, because sometimes people like to pretend like, you know, what you're saying isn't the truth. So until you do a report or some kind of survey or some research and you actually show that what you were saying actually was the truth, then they're like, oh, we're not diverse. You know, like, what's that one conference you talk to black people, but that was anecdotal, right? So, um, you know, then what they did was they got the Mellon and the Walton Family Foundation to give $4 million to support, uh, or $6 million, I'm sorry, to support an initiative to uh, start developing these programs across the country to diversify art museum staff and curators. And then, just this year, they announced a uh, $4 million initiative between the Ford, Mellon, and Walton Family Foundation to um, fund um, this board diversity and inclusion effort. Because they realized, you know, okay, so what if all of our initiatives work? And there's this you know, group of this critical mass of diverse professionals who could go work in museums, but the boards don't want to hire them. So I really like that they're thinking about it from a systems thinking approach, and they're thinking about all the systems that they will need to dismantle to actually become more diverse. Thank you. Hey, Any innovative models that you've seen that have been pretty successful? I think I know this is coming. <laughs> so I, um, so what I said earlier that I, always kind of weird to me that I'm in institutions is because when I began uh, researching about the art and hearing on my own, I was at, I was an undergrad, it was the, actually the top college for art history for undergrads, which is Williams College. 
And um, I kind of went into college knowing what I wanted to study, but Basquiat, keep hearing um, Francesco Clemente, the artist of the 80s, just was not on the curriculum. So I began studying these artists on my own, and uh, one of my instruments in college is here, and he can, can vouch for that. Um, and so um, I didn't know what it would be, and so, um, you know, coming from uh, TV in a way, and my graduate work is in television, um, you, you know, TV is, is a numbers game in a lot of ways. It is, it's, it's about, do you have an audience or not, very point blank. And I think that the kind of golden age of, of black and of black content and content of people of color because you know, in the early 2010s, people were creating web series and showing even if they could not, even if these things didn't go to pilot, that there is an entire market out there that studios were totally ignoring. And so kind of coming from that uh, training and understanding that it's about proving do you have an audience or not, I kind of took that and applied it to the museum or to the art world. And so what I did was, before this went to the Guggenheim, this started out as a digital project. And I've taken the website down since then um, because it's just harder to protect the integrity of the work. Um, and I think when you're dealing just the realities of dealing with an artist like Basquiat, um, the intellectual land grab is rapacious. And it's, I mean, when you're, and for me, where my work intersects with not just Basquiat and Keith Haring, but Andy Warhol, Picasso, I think that the, the art world at the blue chip level is just like a different beast in a lot of ways. Um, so it's just to say that with the digital project, I partnered with Williams to do a one painting exhibition of this painting and we did programming and I taught class. Um, and that was a strategic decision in a lot of ways. One, I personally wanted to bring Basquiat um, back to Williams, but also I knew that this would, where it's positioned, would have the eyes and ears of the art world in a sense. And, we, and I could show that, one, there was a need to engage with Basquiat critically, and there was an audience for that. And I think it kind of went from there. Thank you. And that's a lot of these. Your mom, I think, is the most um, audacious. <laughs> <laughs> because you've taken on the entire art value chain in the work that you do. Uh, can you talk to us about why you pursued that model? What are some of the particular successes you've seen with that model? And just um, any of your insights that you've drawn from? I suppose the need for the models when I sit here listening to you guys talk about museums, we've only just acknowledged that we have museums, you know, um, in terms of it being a place for black people in the UK. You know, I, I talk about the, the funding system and I, um, I shall laugh when I said, you know, 75% of it is goes to the royals, the royal opera house, the royal this, the royal whatever. Um, and the rest of the money is divvied up between absolutely everything within the arts. And museums have gone into the arts in terms of how the structures have changed recently. So if you then start to look at diversity within that, and if you then break it down by culture in terms of heritage, it, you know, there's not a lot. So, you know, where, where do we go and find our heritage when we look at museums? So, um, doing um, the project Archive in the Past Reflecting the Future meant that we needed to find somewhere where we could put it out there. So the publication of that, the digital archive we set is that, and then uh, challenging the institutions and um, trying to break down doors, make sure that our work is um, not just located on the internet, but in the British Library, so you know that it's there. You know, so what, our, our work will get lost. But um, so the only way I think is making the connections between the different parts of the work. And um, um, we started out as a regional project and more and more people keep saying to us that we're national, we're more international than we are regional. Um, and making strategic partnerships and having those friends internationally is the way because then it's about collectively working together. So the books that we have produced are not just about black British art. It is about the diaspora. So you find the voices in there, voices and people that you, you'll, you'll know from um, the US. 
but then you'll find people in there from Guadeloupe, from Martinique, you know, from um, Rwanda, from what, that, that they are the voices of the diaspora because we need to um, pull together. And it's with some of those voices, because people respect things more when it's come from abroad. You don't respect stuff when it's on your own graph. They, mm. they just don't, for whatever reason. It doesn't really matter, that's the, thing, the way it seems to work. But when you've got that weight coming from somewhere else, that thing, oh, and they really respect that, that really helps us. So it's important to join up those dots and, um, and work together. And I think in terms of the model that we're doing, we've joined it up on a very local level in terms of the heritage, the education and the arts, but we've also tried to join it up on the international level because we are diaspora and so it makes perfect sense to me to be working with people in Africa, we're working with people in the Caribbean, so we're working with people in the States. It is a global war, that's what I heard. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, hope you've been challenged and inspired, and please give it up for our creative warriors.